Hey everybody, if you're listening, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. That way you never miss a new episode. Thanks guys. It was just past one win to three man with a four or five step to the door like oh my gosh, just throw that cash in a back bag, run around the back and pull up the track cause yo. What's up everybody? How are you doing? Alright you guys, today I'm so excited. We have my first blood related relative on the show. And you have to let me know if you can see the resemblance. You can tell me of shared DNA. But anyways, John Corey, the myth, the man, the legend. Will you please introduce yourself to those who may not be familiar? Yeah, well, I just gave you a nice introduction. I'm excited to be the first family member to come on the podcast. And um, yeah, I'm Liz's older cousin. I'm in the public relations business. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And I also love to eat. I love to cook. Um, and I think like many of you out there, I have gotten a little bit closer to that particular skill over the last six <laughs> or seven months yes, yes. because we all need to do that, right? Especially if yeah. you want to eat well. Exactly. So I'm, glad, I'm really excited to be here. Well, thank you for coming on. I'm so excited. You guys, if you need recipes for all that cooking at home, head to thelimbo.com. Just kidding. <laughs> um, okay. So John, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. Yep. You're in your 16th year. Of Jeez, business, yeah. At Green Target, sixteen years. That but I want to back it up. I want to back it up a little further. Yeah, I, I need to know the beginning. I need to know the origin story. You can get the kid stuff you want or not. But I sure. want to know, like, how did you get here in this moment on the Ireland podcast? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll go way back. So I, <clears throat> I went to Calvin College. I'm a EGR graduate. For those that are, you know, in the West Michigan community, but I would go to Calvin College, a really nice liberal arts school here in West Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I thought I wanted to get into broadcast journalism. Mm. So I got at the time, which was a pretty coveted internship at the ABC affiliate in Chicago. And who was going to be my wife-to-be at the time, she was coming to Chicago to go to start law school. So I mm. thought, okay, I'm gonna get this internship. She's mm. going to law school. Let's see where this takes us. Okay. And I was working under, and unbeknownst to me, uh, one of the, the most influential news directors in the country, certainly in the city of Chicago. Her name is Kathy Anderson. And I am her assistant, her intern. Every company, every public relations firm, anyone who's anyone wanting publicity is trying to get to Kathy Anderson. Mm. I'm the uh, person that's the in gatekeeper. between that, right? Yeah. So, you know, the station's looking at anywhere five to 600 stories a day, they cover 10. And people are coming at me left and right, and all of a sudden people are saying, "Hey, I'd like to take you to lunch." And they're, I'm getting gifts, I'm getting stuff. And I start to realize <laughs> yeah. people think I like have some crazy influence here. So I started to accept some lunch and invitations. I actually went out to a couple of dinners, but to make a long story short, I started to get more interested in the public relations side of the business because I was seeing how these folks worked and how they went about yeah. their craft. Mm. And a little, a little charming, perhaps. Well, it was. It was, it was did you see a little mirror of the wait, charm? So I, for anyone that doesn't know what PR is, like yes. how how would you explain yeah, it? Yeah, that's a lens? great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because so many different areas of marketing are coming together, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. You have earned media, which is public relations. I'll talk about that in a minute. You have owned media. You have paid media, shared media. Public relations is really about you know telling having the opportunity to tell a story about what you do, how you do it, or what makes your point of view interesting or unique, whether it's a product, whether it is a service, but trying to get others to talk about it, mm -hmm. others to write about it. You know, it's the, the third party editorial endorsement that comes from the filter of a professional publication or a professional editor. So mm -hmm. when we get public, like my clients, they want to be quoted in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. They want to speak at industry conferences. They want to publish research that you know very influential mm. media organizations want to write about and share with their readers who comprise their clients and prospects they want to reach so for the types of clients that we serve which we'll talk about in my particular field we specialize in financial and professional services so mm. advertising isn't a way for them to get in front of their audience they mm. have to demonstrate expertise right. they have to demonstrate authority so earned media um, is a big part of it. So public relations is really about, you know, telling your story through channels where you have to earn the opportunity to express a point of view. And right. the more skillfully you do it, 
you know, the, the greater the column inches, the more impact, the greater the credibility versus just publishing on your own or paying for messages mm. to get out. Does that kind of make sense? It makes sense. So you get bit by this bug. Get bit by this bug and then I just, you know, I built all these relationships, you know, over that six month period worth for Kathy. And then my internship was coming up and the the trajectory in the broadcast field is then you go to like a small little podunk town. We're going to send you to this little town mm-hmm. in Oklahoma or this little teeny town in Illinois or in Alabama and you're going to work your way up. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to some of the anchors and others and a lot of them weren't that happy. Yeah. Yeah. They've been there 20, 30 years. They're like, oh, dude, if I were you, I wouldn't get into this. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I mean, no one was like, hey, you're getting in at the golden time of right. broadcast. Mm-hmm. So I was a little turned off to it from that standpoint. But then the relationships I'd built, and I nurtured a few of those. And then I then I was uh, offered an internship at Golan Harris Communications, which yeah. is another big PR firm. And I was working on the Chrysler account. And then from there, I was offered a job uh, by the husband at the time of a friend of my sister's, Meredith, uh-huh. um, at a firm called the Financial Relations Board, which was primarily an investor relations firm, basically doing PR and marketing for the stock of publicly traded companies. But okay. about a third of their revenue was doing what I do today, representing professional services firms, law firms, accounting firms, consulting, private equity, mm-hmm. venture capital, investment banks. And that was a great, great fit for me. Um, I think I did really well there. I became a partner there at the age of 27. So you're extremely young, moving fast. I was the youngest partner ever at that firm. What is it about you that made you so good at that job? I don't know. I don't, I don't think it was anything particular. I just, I worked really hard. Um, I was excellent at doing uh, media relations work. Like. Here's a, here's a point of view or a story or a concept that a, that a client wants to be recognized for, and I can help to translate that in a way yeah. that a journalist would want you know, to write, to write about it, about it right. or to receive an article about it. Or I will sense. say, because I get pitches all day every day from obviously food brands, and uh, the, the pitch, the pitches, there's good pitches and not great pitches. And I think yeah. the art of the pitch is, is a real thing, and so many pitches... You know, it's like Dear XX, like they forget to customize it, or they really don't understand how that would translate to a message from you. So you obviously yeah. were good at figuring out. You yes. made it easier for the journalist to write about you. Or- and it continues to be one of the just the hallmarks of Green Target today. When you now you bring data and analytics right. and all this really cool, you know, insight mm-hmm. that we have into audiences today. But yeah, that's what I, I, I. So many. You're right. So many people in the business. You know, they, they, they become known as flex, you know, mm-hmm. flax in the PR. You know, like a lot of, you know, media folks don't like a lot of PR people because it's all about them versus I, I learned at a very young age in the business that this is about, this isn't about you, the report, this is about your audience. Exactly. Right. Here's something that I know your audience What's cares helpful about. To them? Or right. here's a problem or here's a challenge and here's an opportunity. And be able to communicate that. And my clients got some actionable guidance or right. interesting point of view that can help your reader. And here's why... You know, here's why uh, there's a little bit of urgency to the story. Yeah. Here's the novelty that my client can bring to the topic. But here's the utility. At the end of the day, your reader has to have something that they can act on or learn from. Mm-hmm. And and I think, you know, reporters learn that I could help them tell a, a, a good story. And then, you know, as you build those relationships, they take your calls. Like, right. all right, right, we are going to exactly. trust you. You, so uh, you know what you're doing. You're 27. How do you navigate being so young? Like, what was the age gap between your like other partners? Were they like was like like you're 27, they're 40, or they're 20, they're like 50, 60? Like mid to upper 30s for okay. a lot of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how did you manage being a young leader at that time? Obviously, you're 27. It was. Uh, oh gosh, it was um, a lot of failures, or like were you great no, from the start? There was a uh, one situation where I um, so. Right before, you know, I became partner, a woman in the division I was in, she went on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I was told, you know, preside over these clients, you know, while she's away. And I did. I stepped up and I had been doing a lot of the work, a lot of the execution, but I stepped up and became more of a client relationship manager. 
started to do a little bit more strategy, kind of, you know, going upstream yeah. in terms of my skills, my experience. And then um, about a week before she came back, my boss said, okay, these are your clients now. Mm. Mm. I'm like, well, the person that's coming back, she's coming back in a week. It's like, I don't care. These are your clients now. Wow. And she comes back, and I figured out within a couple of days that no one had communicated to her, yeah. you know, what the transition was, was. being made. Because she was like, okay, thanks for everything you did. I'm back now. And you're like, wow. <laughs> and was she older than you, obviously? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great woman. Smart, strategic. Anyway, there was, uh, so that was one of the... Just when you ask the question. This is what, what it's like the, to be a woman in America, folks. Thanks for tuning oh, in. Geez. It's been great. Isn't it neat? Isn't it cool? Have kids. And that no, was, yeah. That is like a real thing that It women, put me in a position that I didn't course. appreciate being put in. And, we and think of how often out. that must happen. Did that shape your leadership style too? Like, do, you don't do that, I'm guessing. Of course not. Do you allow no, no, that no, your, no, women, I, your employees that have babies, do they get to come back to their Well, job, not just like right? the baby thing, but not like the clear, direct <laughs> communication. That's we too. worked it out. It yeah. all got worked out. Um, but that was... You became partner. Yeah. Well, it's like, <laughs> it's like it, well, it taught me early on that you, know, you get put in positions of in business where it's work. not like someone else is going to provide the explanation. You're being put in this situation. You've done a good job, but now you have to... Yeah, I just... Yeah. yeah it was... I thought it was kind of bizarre. Yeah. But anyway. an example, just some of the political tension. Of course. I didn't run into a whole lot of it. To be honest mm -hmm. with you. So um, what, then you were at Weber Shanwick? So then the Financial Relations Board gets bought by Weber Shanwick. Okay. Why? Okay. Um, now, through mergers and acquisitions, you'll see a lot of different redundant groups, practices that get folded into yeah. each other. So Weber has a huge consumer practice and a big corporate practice and a big crisis practice. So every time they would do acquisitions, would. the consumer, the court, you know, those would fold into these bigger, bigger practices. In terms of doing professional financial services work, none of the firms they bought did that kind of work. Mm. Well, I realized, okay, no one at this entire firm knows how to read an income statement. Right. Uh, mm. No one knows how to serve the kind of client. I mean, they thought right. we were like geniuses because we could work with an investment bank or right. an insurance company <laughs> or a law firm. Yeah. And that's not the case. Yeah. Mm. Just, just like anything, you get to know their business. You get to know how you know, uh, how customers or clients, you know, buy right. what they do, what influences that decision making, you market, you know, to that. So that was fortunate that we could become a part of a big global firm and no other division or no other acquired company had that experience or skill that we had. Okay, that's so that helped us to net. look, you know, to, so we were on the radar yeah. of, uh, yeah. of leadership. They knew who we were and like, okay, we'll just leave these guys alone. What right. they're doing exactly. at the time. Okay. So so that's uh, circa 98 when FRB got bought. And then... So you stay there for a little bit? You grow Until it? 2004. Until December 2004. Oh, wow. December 3rd, to be exact. Oh, really? Is when we... Uh, when me and two partners resigned. Okay, what was the form? Yeah. So what was that moment where you're like, okay, we're doing our own thing? Was it too much like corporate, <laughs> slow, not what you're used to? Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So Weber is a phenomenal firm. Yeah. Great people, um, great leadership, great clients. But the types of clients that we serve tend to be multi-office, multi-specialty. I mean, we represent mm -hmm. law firms today that have 60 offices, yeah. right? They're on, you know, three different continents, four different continents. And, you know, when you, when you bring in a piece of business like that, you know, they want to know, okay, you're based in Chicago, you're based in New York, you're in London. We're going to serve you on the ground in all your major money financial centers. Yeah. We're going to serve you at a practice group level. We're going to serve you at an industry level. Yeah. So having talent in different regions is important. Mm -hmm. At the time, Weber counted money at the local office level. It was local profit mm. centers. So here I, I remember bringing in, this is one of my first big new business wins. This yeah. was in 98. Um, it was a top 20 law firm in the country. Okay. They had like 30 offices and crazy. They, uh, they sent the RFP out to 40 firms. It got windowed down. Dang. We won the business. I led the whole effort, which was exciting. Okay. So this is a big win. This is a yeah. big win for you. This is a Dude. big win. Yeah. So we're starting up the client and I go and hand select. I got a couple people in LA. I want someone in San Francisco. I, uh, there's a couple people in New York I need and I had the, the core team in Chicago. Profit Center director comes in and says, what, 
why are you giving all this revenue away all over the, these different offices? Like, well, so because we this is how we sold the business. Right. They need us on the ground in these regions. That's how we won. Yeah. And I don't know if you've looked at our website lately, but that's the whole <laughs> promise. <laughs> that we're, we're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> we're a big national global firm. I'm just tapping the platform. Yeah. She's like, oh, that's just you know, let's try to let's try to keep it. Uh, try to work on it out of Chicago if we can. Uh, oh. So. That yeah. and again, we got it all worked out, but just that type of stuff and just the cost structure and the platform of a big firm oh, like yeah. Weber, which you get, terrific firm. Which just, I get is not Green Target's goal is to be a Weber Shamwick, right? No. So let's talk no, size. No. What's the difference in size people versus? Well, Weber's got, you know, I don't know. I mean, thousands okay. of people. So the nice thing is you're now more of a boutique agency. I would say, so what we do is... Super niche, obviously. Yeah. We help, you know, law, accounting, consulting, you know, financial institutions. We help financial professional services firms create unique positions of authority. And we do it by helping them to participate skillfully in the conversations right. that matter most to the audiences that they want to reach. Like that so, mission statement right there? That was fantastic. Yeah. So in the, in the offering, that. you know, we've been investing and in developing and honing an offering over the last, gosh, several years uh, that really hinges on five areas. So earned is the number one. Mm -hmm. So earned to me, again, helping organizations earn the opportunity to express yeah. points of view, traditional third-party editorial filtered press. Yeah. Um, second, which is so unique to us, is our research and market intelligence capability. So we produce anywhere from 50 to 60 major studies a year to help clients create yeah. more substantive and sustainable thought leadership positions. Yep. Because they can get out and speak and publish, and that moves the brand, and mm -hmm. it's all great. But when you come out with a powerful piece of research, right that has an interesting hypothesis that's focused on a particular market segment or set of audiences, you know, who typically are those that our clients are trying to market to. Right, yeah. so you're obviously doing research studies towards very specific topics exactly. that can really help you move and you know, you know the yes. business, you've been there for right. so long. Exactly. So, yeah. But then, then you get in, then you, the third piece of the offering is our content editorial. So I've been bringing over editors from the Wall Street Journal, from Forbes, from Fortune, from major industry mm -hmm. publications that can help take what we do in the research and other areas, and I, you know, and distill it into really interesting right. narratives and stories. And because, yes, we're building profile and reputation for clients through third party press. But as you guys well know, yeah. our clients are communicating directly to stakeholders through websites and microsites and blogs and digital magazines and social media. Mm -hmm. And our clients are dealing in really sophisticated, complex issues. Mm -hmm. And they need to have editors and writers that are very skilled mm -hmm. that can Pass grasp yeah. those complex issues and write about them in accessible ways. So where are those stories published? Well, a lot of times they're published, it could be an op-ed in the New York Times or the mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal. Uh, we create, have created an award-winning digital magazine for one of our management consulting clients That's called cool. Berkeley Research Group. It's called okay. ThinkSet. So helping our uh, clients to, to know that you, know, you can act like a media company. Right. You can be a media company yourself. Yeah. We're going to publish you know, with the same you know, editorial vigor and objectivity that Forbes would right. or you know the mm -hmm. economist would but we're going to do it for yourself yeah. and we're going to make it all about the audience and we're going to we're going to bring different sources and expertise together and we're going to tell stories that we know are going to resonate with the audience because we're going to do research and use data and other tools to get a sense of what they care most about mm -hmm. and we're going to deliver that content to them in you know in very creative and intuitive ways so so okay half step back are you, do you still have your partners in your business still? Are you guys still working together? I have one. So there's me and one other partner who've, uh, yeah. And okay. We got a great partnership. So yep. I have a question on partnership. Yes. And so were you guys like nap, like pen and napkin, like during lunch break, like planning you guys' yeah. move? Like, yo, like they, they try to stifle me. Like, you know, I don't like this control aspect yeah. of it. I brought this <laughs> huge fucking business in. Like, no, like we're going to move on. Was Were you leading that charge or all three of you guys kind of, or two of you guys kind of like, ah, we should kind of do our own thing. We had a third partner at the time Okay. who was a bit older than us. He was, uh, you know, and in, in he had hired me earlier at FRB, Financial Relations Board. He wasn't with us for, he was with us for like three or four years. Okay. It was time for him to move on. Okay. But um, the 
what he really brought to the early formation of the company is, you know, we went out, we raised money. Okay. We raised a half million bucks to okay. get started. We also, what was that money specifically for at that time? To hire people? Like, it was like, you know what, for we're going to need, like, yeah, we're gonna need to have real estate. We're going to need to have computers and phones. We're going to need to be able to recruit. And we felt, we felt like, hey, we're going to bring some revenue over yeah. you know, right away. So we're going to need to defend ourselves if yeah. we... Uh, <laughs> right. The way they better shake yeah. some half in it. Yeah. So <laughs> just that, sense. yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we were pretty organized. I mean, we developed an offering memoranda. We developed, mm-hmm. I mean, we kind of legally had plotted out what, to know, do. what the business was going to look like. Yeah. So were you always like CEO leading it or were you more sales? Like how do you guys like divvy up? Like who's going to do what? Because obviously yeah. you like, to me, it seems like you're a sales guy. Like, you're able to bring in big business because you understood your, your audience and your client. But also you seem like you have management skills as well. Well, I'll tell you, it, you know, you, and you, you learn a lot of skills as you're immersed in the situation. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, that is very true. Was uh, HR your favorite aspect of leadership? Oh gosh. Yeah. We uh, we outsource that but uh, immediately. But we like, do oh yeah. Yeah, but we have a we have a head of talent strategy now yeah. who actually is one of our most gifted account strategists too in relationship okay. people. Wow. So that's you know, that's in the last couple of years that we've been able to bring that on. But um, just in terms of me and, you know, my partner today, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm outward facing, you Mm -hmm. know, I'm, you know, I I lead a lot of major client relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, Outward facing, is the other one not? Is he more? He is. He's outward facing too. He's also technical. What's the opposite of outward? He's Ah, he's like spreadsheet systems, cash flow. Yeah. He's brilliant with that stuff. Yeah. And the reason I brought it up is because I want people who are listening, uh, guys, that a lot of people want to do partnerships and they don't understand how to divvy up roles. Oh, yeah. And I feel a lot of people like it crosses over. And I always say there can't be two cooks so right. in the yeah, kitchen. Yeah, friends want to go to work together and then. You're so right. Yeah, like so it's. Yeah. And I was just talking to somebody the other day about, you know, they're, they're explaining their business structure and like all these people are all owners and all of them are being seen. I'm like, yo, who's running the business? Like, <laughs> who's making the day-to-day decisions? They're like, all of us are like, ah. Uh. You yeah. know, unless you can't like have a conversation to come up with, it has to be a person who's like, we're, we're leaning on him or her to make those decisions. So I was just curious about So we make those decisions that. together, but yeah. now that, you know, 16 years of scaling and growing the business and putting new systems mm-hmm. and process in place at different thresholds along the way, we have a CFO, yeah, um, and he has a law degree and an accounting degree, okay. so he's also our acting general counsel. Okay, and between him and other members of the senior leadership team, I mean, yeah, we have really smart people that are supporting different functions wow. of the business. But then Aaron and I make decisions together. What's right? your favorite part of owning this company? Like, what you know, obviously you've had to wear many hats. Yeah. Right? But which one, like we always talk about your creative genius zone, like which one is your actual favorite that you just go right into flow state? I mean, is every- Oh, like is, my comfort zone? Yeah. Probably like just, you know, serving client, like relationships with clients. Yeah. And I love cultivating relationships with clients. And I love, you know, when you, when you grow the firm and we have maybe, you know, 40, 50 active clients today, like mm-hmm. big retainer type relationships, various shapes and sizes. Yeah. But at any given point in the cycle, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to have certain clients that have a few problems going on or a few team members that are kind of in a rut or a few things going on. I'm very good. Or maybe a client's complaining about something wasn't quite the way she yeah. would have liked to have seen it. Yeah. I'm great at like embracing that complaint, stepping in, fixing the Putting situation. Putting out fires. Yeah. I do a lot of that. And a lot of people don't like to do it. And it's yeah, kind of, when, when it first gets brought to my attention, I'm like, yeah, you, know, you want to go strangle somebody, right? Yeah, who did it? Who did it? Why did you, you do like, that? I bet you have like a charm about you to just. But ease, then, but here's the thing: once you you listen to the client and have empathy, you listen. It's a lot of listening. A lot listening. of you guys. Listening. It's all about leading with empathy. We always go back. Listen, to that. have empathy. Then with the team, okay, here's what we're gonna do, and we're gonna. And what I will tell you is that every one of those situations presents an opportunity to actually strengthen that relationship. Oh, how you respond to the client mm-hmm. and how you show leadership and grace with the team. Mm-hmm. So while I hate to get that call saying something yeah. just went wrong, I'll bite my own tongue, yeah. you know, but then when you're done with the process and things get back on track and the client's happy and the team is appreciative, then it's like, there's like a nice quiet satisfaction. Yeah. That okay. Comes with that. 
love wow. that. So, okay, so you now you're at this point, you, you have your own firm with a couple of partners or a partner. One partner. One yeah. partner. You guys are killing it, obviously. We're doing well. Right? Yeah. So talk about the We're not like, you know, lemon bowl killing it, but we're doing okay. That's a hard level to get to. It's hard, really hard to get to. But like, so I'm, I'm interested in scaling. Yes. So how do you determine that, like, growth and yeah, team and and what client. comes first more clients and then employees or more employees such than a great clients question. Yeah, how do you such a great question yeah. you know cuz i of, i'm in the moment in my business where i don't necessarily believe that i need more employees to necessarily grow sure which is seems counterintuitive well you're the brand right you know it's a different business model for sure mm-hmm. i just yeah. a lot of people in my space being an online business owners yeah you know they bring in all these people then suddenly they're spending their days managing a bunch of people and want to end their lives because they're not right. doing anything remotely that they enjoy anyways i <laughs> but i want to just I, this is just on my mind right now no yeah and that's because uh, obviously what comes first the, the employee or the client I'll oh, go ahead. I want to well, get your perspective. On yeah, this. it's um, there's there's different ways that uh, companies go about it. Here's the one thing that uh, that we're fortunate to have in our business, and that is predictable revenue. And okay. What I mean by that is 95 percent of our clients are retainer clients. Right. I was so they that. commit to spending a certain amount of money with us or each year, and they do yeah. annual contracts or beyond one year in perpetuity okay. until somebody Besides cancels not it or two. changes it. Perfect. Right. Okay. So you take the retainers, and that's maybe seventy percent of our revenue in a given year. And then okay. we know, you know, the, okay. there's going to be projects and research mm-hmm. and new things on top of that that will come in. So seventy percent of your income is somewhat fixed. Somewhat fixed. Yeah, we know it's going to be there, and we know we want to grow at eight to ten percent. I was just going to ask. So your goal is to grow that eight to ten. About how, eight to how many 10. people do you lose each year, or not really? You know, we're in an industry where there's a lot of turnover. Yeah. We'll probably lose maybe sometimes, maybe two or three okay. people a year. And the nice thing, about, well, the nice thing about it is that, you know, they're going on to in-house positions or going to do something pretty cool. Yeah. We don't lose people to competitors. No, I meant clients, but that's also interesting. Oh, the clients. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about people. But that's also good. Clients, thing. we don't. You guys keep them. We're, I love yeah. That. Keep, yeah. Do a goddamn good job. And you're so niched out. 60% of our clients have been with us five years or longer. That's huge. Um, we have, I couldn't tell you the percentage, but several have been with us for 10 plus years. And oh, wow. three of our founding clients are still with us. That's we don't cool. turn clients. I mean, that's uh, getting back to. Are most of your clients mm-hmm. word of mouth? You know, reputation, yeah. yeah, reputation, word of mouth, but also we're getting a lot more sophisticated in the marketing that we're doing. Are you doing Facebook? I mean, not Facebook ads, but are you doing any sort of advertising? We don't do. We do a little bit of uh, what I guess the 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 uh, some paid search. Yeah, we're doing, and paid search brings people to the website. Oh yeah, which yeah. is nice. It's oh, yeah. very targeted, mm-hmm. but we're all about taking the audiences that hire us. So chief marketing officers, heads of communication, mm-hmm. and the C-suite, mm-hmm. you know, C-level executives and yep. the types of clients, you know, that what we consider to be right fit clients. And you go through that exercise, mm-hmm. developing personas. What are the problems? What are the challenges? What are the pain points? And then how can we come up with different topics and issues that help us to create problem solving points of view that speak to those issues? And then mm-hmm. you come up with a content strategy and a publishing calendar. So it's more of an inbound marketing strategy to get people to come to us. That's and our, smart. Yeah, and our website's got some real, really proud of the content that we're putting up there. We just published our manifesto on authority positioning. Okay. You should take a look at okay, it. We spent, it's pretty cool. We spent probably three to four months just editing and refining it after we wrote it. But it wow. really captures the spirit and the essence of what we're all about mm-hmm. in that one manifesto document. Which, is, right. which is huge. Uh, yeah. You have a question? You can go ahead. Well, I want to go back to like the scaling part. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> My business side is like itching right now. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, give me like the, the breakdowns revenue wise to determine scale in your opinion. Like zero, like let's say 500K to 1 million. One million to two, yeah, two to sure, yeah. It's yeah. like you know the as I think about it in our growth because we're you know we're about a you know say nine million dollar agency just yeah. on the top line. Um, yeah, you get to that you know that one to one point five million. Yeah, you have certain infrastructure, and then mm-hmm. you go to three, and you got to hire some more people. Mm-hmm. You got to have some more systems. Okay, and then you go that I would say the jump from three to five 
it was like the most difficult. I bet. Mm. What was so difficult about it? Well, it's because maintaining your culture, getting, maintaining your value, like culture. Well, that's when you got to get serious about these. Yeah. Your values. Uh, I'm telling you, values are so essential. And we can talk more about this because mm-hmm. we've learned like if you really are serious about your values and they're firmly understood and bought into, mm-hmm. a pandemic hits. Oh, yeah. You know, once every hundred years, yeah. everyone's geographically dispersed. Yeah. yeah. You can see what holds you together in oh, the yeah. way of client experience and service and whatnot. The values play a key role into it. But yeah, going from three to five, it's like, okay, we have to hire more people. We have to have a more sophisticated financial accounting system. Mm-hmm. Got to have a full, we gotta, we're got we getting to the point where we have to have a full-time CFO. Um, we're also have- getting to the point where... We better indoctrinate our approach to client service and how we do what we do because now we're getting to a point where myself and my partner can't touch You can't touch everything anymore, right? We got to be able to have, I remember thinking at that three to four million dollar level, like I can't wait till we have big, awesome clients that don't know who I am. Yeah. Yeah, That's your goal. (laughs) (laughs) How do you? Well, they do because you know, you know and tell them and you appreciate them. Yeah. yeah, but still, but I don't have to be involved. So how, because I'm at the stage where for me to massively grow, I need basically another list, right? So how did you make sure that your clients that, that aren't able to touch you as often, yep. that are still getting the John touch? What's up, guys? Subscribe, 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 subscribe. Tell your best friend, tell your mom, tell your neighbor, tell your, uh, your four-year-old kid, please listen. We appreciate you. And thank you so much for all of your five-star reviews on Apple. That helps us get this podcast out to other people who will enjoy. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And with that, enjoy the rest of the episode. You're going to learn. You're going to learn. So how did you make sure that your clients that that aren't able to touch you as often that are still getting the John touch? You know, how how did you do that? One of the main things that we did is we created our client service mantra called the Green Target Way. I wrote that up um, with the help of a few colleagues. So the first iteration probably came out about 2007, 2008. So basically showing you know, here's why clients hire us. Here are the things that we do that we believe are exceptional and unique. And when it comes to serving clients, it was very tactical. At first. Yeah. So like, what are the things that we do for a client, you know, uh, on a week to week basis, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, on a semi-annual basis, on an annual basis, like different touch points. Yeah. And, and then we wrote up these sections on, okay, if a client relationship is starting to get stagnant, how do you breathe new life and energy into it? Um, if a client relationship is starting to feel like, you know, the, the client isn't being a good client, yeah. you know, they're not being fair, they're not mm-hmm. being above board, um, or they're preventing us from doing our best work. What are the things that we can do to counter that? So we started to populate this document with different scenarios that we face, you know, somewhat frequently in, in these longstanding client relationships, right? Because we have yeah. clients where there's been five or six CMOs. Yeah. There's been three or four different CEOs. Yeah. yeah. Several heads of comms. We're the only constant fixture. Right. Sure. I have a few clients that I can tell them what was going on. You know, right. I, you know, I was I was there <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. A client that I used to have in my former place. Yeah. These people have no idea How you what was going on. Do you I, listen to the CMO podcast with Jeff Stengel? I've heard of it. It's yeah. incredible. It's all CMOs. Is it? Yeah. Like they had Panera on today and Ulta Beauty. And yeah, a lot of times... The agency is the more constant than anyone in the actual company. Yeah, totally. And it's like that's that's how you build trust and all that. And we well, you know the average tenure to CMO is like two years. Right. right. That's like a get dinosaur crazy. CMO. Yeah. They get and they get their stock options, get out on the next project. So uh, so you go. So yeah, going from three to five new systems, and then there. you finally get there, and they're like, oh gosh, we really want to keep it going further. So yeah. we kept thinking. So like, that's the other thing is, how did you decide? Because obviously at this point you have a comfortable life. Oh, yeah. You've got a great house. Your family's provided. You know what I mean? How do you decide how much wealth you want to amass? Or how, what was your motivation for growth? Let me tell you. Yeah. Because <laughs> motivation is different. I'll tell Not you. everybody's just looking for a nice car. Not everybody's looking for... I wasn't pointing. I'm saying there's all the different buckets of like... I want to start I mean, a charity. I you want might to start... think this sounds crazy. No, we want to hear but, this. We talk about this all the time. But in terms of... So our um, vision for the company. You know, we have our vision, our mission, our differentiation... Our vision is to be a destination for talent. 
Oh, I love That's that. first and foremost. That's smart. You know, a place where talent can thrive. Um, and if we have, you know, is that really why you have that th- sick building? It's part of it. I mean, that's this building, Vince. You gotta check it out. Yeah, it's a floor. I mean, <laughs> need to check the it. view, do the lemon bowl, and Irie lemon. Please, you know, yeah, something. We'll have to go eat and do some stuff. Uh, pandemic series. Yeah, we'll wear masks. Perfect. We'll go check it out. The views. I got a couple spots. No, but this office is stunning. You know, you you, you yeah, do get up the elevator. You want to work there. So, yeah. People pay attention to this. So I, want, I have to see it. Oh, obviously. yeah. So, so well, back to your question, it's like we feel like, well, we have to keep growing at a certain clip so that we can give career opportunity mm-hmm. to our oh, people. Oh, to keep your people. You we have to keep growing. We want them to be able to grow. I never to thought be about to, that. That's, that's that the sense. reason. I agree because I think the biggest thing about – so I never like had a job or went the corporate route just because I Lucky was – Lucky you. Yeah, I feel like I missed out on like structure – Right, like understanding how things should work or how they can work, because I've always been doing it my way. And where, where I struggle with that is like, okay, how do I explain what I'm doing to make this thing work? Right, because yeah. like that's right. what you just explained earlier. Like, okay, there's, yeah, a, yeah. there's a reason how there's a reason in uh, how you do things, or like why you go back and not just leave a client who's had a bad day or a bad issue with you. Yeah. There's a reason why you go back and try to fix it versus. Oh, we go into the next client, right? Right, like that's not in your culture, that's not in your value set, right? And so you have to like teach those, you have to systemize that, so your people can recognize a problem, do it when you're not there, and then that's how you scale and grow, obviously, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's not easy. No, it's not, it's not easy. easy. But I'll tell you, having um, I can't imagine doing this alone, not having a business partner, because he and I, we, I mean, why don't you talk about that? partnership and what makes it so strong and why it is so beneficial to have a partner so and it's like a marriage yeah i'm telling you i mean how many businesses do you know are partners where they can't stand each other or the business fails because they couldn't work things out Mm -hmm. oh yeah they didn't know how to operate in a complementary way Um, probably good businesses that just because the relationship wasn't strong yeah it dissolves so when i look back on our relationship we're really good friends Mm -hmm. i mean we travel with our families once a year we've been to the cayman islands together 10 times are you sad uh, that I'm letting the people in right now? Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I am. Uh, but, but John was in high school. Now we got kids in high school. We so why is it so important? Like we talk all the time, like our friendship's more important than our partnership. So why yes. talk about that? Friendship and trust. You, you know each other. You mm-hmm. know each other's motivations. And, yeah. and we have, I think, great respect and admiration for each other's talents. Mm-hmm. You know, I respect him immensely as a professional and his talents. I know he does me as well. And in just the way we can divide and conquer and touch clients and touch our people Mm -hmm. and make a difference. You're better. You can do more together than you could apart. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't always agree on stuff. Yeah. That's part of it. But that's, that's fine. You know, you talk it out and it's like, and when we have disagreements, he's like, well, you know, it's like one of us will be like, well, if you're more passionate to or not do it, it's like, (laughs) yeah, just do it. I trust you. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. I, and I do think the respect for each other's talents is such a big thing. I, mm-hmm. I, I watch people try to work together, and they're like too competitive with each other. I'm like, oh, yeah. it won't work. Or you have situations where it's like one person's contributing a lot more a than thousand another person, and then it's like, and that's no one's fault. That is the tough situation. It just turns out, that way. You know, we're just you know we have a we're lucky and fortunate that that's not the case. It's a naturally you're equally fifty fifty contributing. We treat yeah yeah we're, yep. Yeah. And was, I'm guessing it was pretty easy. Well, I don't know. I'm guess. I'm asking now. Was it easy for you guys to divide and conquer? Because you guys kind of knew you guys yourselves by the time you guys started something. Well, you figured or, it out. Or was it kind of like, oh, I thought I should be doing what you, I realized you're way better at this than I am. Yeah, I learned as you go yes. as you were growing, right? Yes. He would like when it came to like you know some of the spreadsheets and the process <laughs> and whatnot. He just naturally would do it. Yeah. And do it extremely well. It wasn't even a question of well, here, let me step in and screw that up. No, yeah. that wasn't that wasn't a part of the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I developed some developing clients and some relationships, yeah. and I mean, it just we just naturally did what we were very good at. But then, as you scale and grow, then you know, we're all about getting out of our comfort zones. Yeah, we talk about that to. all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, get comfortable, Being getting uncomfortable. uncomfortable. You know, because that's where we grow. And and it's so funny because you can be out of your comfort zone and you can sit and lament about it. I'll see people like, you know, they're nervous or they're anxious. And I try to tell them, I even tell myself this a lot too. It's like, okay, you're uncomfortable right now. It's good. Yeah, it's okay. Right. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yep. 
You're going to be okay. That's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's Lack plenty, of judgment. There's plenty of time to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. You know? I think for so for so many people, it's hard, right? Because they want to do a good job. They want to be perfect. I know. And it's like, I know. And like, I think it's great for a leader to be able to be like, hey. Yeah. And ain't nobody's perfect. I think yes. everyone judges. Now, don't them. lose, you know, a $10 million contract now. But, like, you, you can mess up here and there. Yeah. Right? I want to give you a little room to maneuver. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So, let's, may I ask a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I want to ask you a <laughs> personal question. Sure. So, obviously, right now, if you're listening in real time, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, it's a crazy time. It's a lot. we're turning the corner. Well, Sorry, we're turning the corner. <laughs> no, we definitely are. Or wait, that was on one station. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and not quote Who to listen to? I'm going to go ahead and not quote any questions. So what I would I'm love totally to talk kidding. about. I know we're not turning the corner. <laughs> wear a mask. Okay, so what I'd love to talk about is what are some of the unexpected hidden perks? I call them pandemic perks. Because there's been a oh, lot yeah. of them for me. <laughs> Pandemic yeah. perks. Pandemic perks. Hashtag that, guys. <laughs> yeah. But I would love to hear two or three of the pandemic perks that maybe especially those that you didn't foresee happening. Um, and maybe, you know, I think our mindset about the pandemic in March is different than it is now in October or November. So just tell me a few things about how and just how from a personal standpoint your life has changed because of it. Yeah, it's a great question. I think about it all the time, too. I think number one, you think about um, quality time and presence with family. I mean, obviously, that like immediately we all had that. Because how old are your kids for the audience? So I have uh, an 18 year old who's a freshman down at Wake Forest in North Carolina. And then I have, he's the son, and I have daughters that are uh, junior and freshman in high school. So So they're getting, you're about to be empty nesters. So this is cherished time you'll never get back. It is. Mm -hmm. is That's something I've heard hands down from any parent I know that has high school kids Mm -hmm. or that college kids that came home. Yeah. I mean, that's time you will look back in 10 years and be so grateful for that. I think so. And I think even though they might not realize it now, they will too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, totally. Totally. Yeah. I think the quality time has been great. Um, Cooking. Right. Right. I mean, we just had just, your meatballs, by the way. Oh yeah, you guys, Fantastic. meatballs. You know yeah. what? You know our, the cooking show we're gonna do. Yeah. Sneak peek, guys. John needs to come on. I would love yeah. to cook with you guys. Why don't you tell a little teaser about this cooking show? Yeah. So uh, Liz and I are gonna start doing a cooking show, and we're gonna have guests on who make who also good cooks. Yeah. Or can, in can, in can, the can, kitchen with Liz and Vince. Yes, exactly. So we have one guy who wants to make sausages. Lou, say yeah. listening to this. Yeah. We'll get you on, and then I think your meatballs were great, and I know. Um, I think you're a great chef or yeah. learning how to cook at least or whatever. Yes. Which by the way, through the pandemic. And John's talk. mom is, you know, the matriarch of our family, you know, the amazing Syrian cook where I learned all of my, I mean, you guys, the lemon bowl. So they know, we're, so we're first cousins. Yeah. Our moms are sisters. There's a third sister. They grew up, you know, with great cooks, women cooking in our family, ethnic cuisine cooking. I mean, the real deal. Right. I mean, there was always a, a bone, you know, boiling in a pan, something in the oven. Vince and I laugh because people will be like, why are there bones in my chicken? You know, younger, you know, or kids that just didn't grow yeah. up with people cooking from scratch. And Vince is like, well, chicken has bones well, in it, it folks. Yeah. Like, there's supposed to be bones. It's an animal, by the way. But people I don't. realize. Like, you know, <laughs> out of the world, you see your friends, like, people, it's like, they're, they freak they out. Cook. Their parents yeah. didn't cook. They were getting We're very out. spoiled living, growing up around foodies. And I had it, I mean, on both sides, like Ema Luba, you know, it's lots great, of isn't food. It? Yeah. Because oh, I think it is. gives you, like, an insight to knowing who you are. Right, like we do, we do, we do race. We do a lot of things to separate ourselves. But I feel like food is how you can really learn about somebody's culture. And yeah. so, like for me, it's like, all right, if I eat your food authentically, yeah. I understand you more, right? Because I understand mm-hmm. what you like to eat. Do those cabbage rolls today give you a little for more example, insight? right? And the mindset, <laughs> or like the culture, like where they're from. When True. you when you eat my food, like okay, I can see how you guys get oh, down yeah. this way just because of your situation, right? And I think. Growing up, when I used to go to my friend's house where they, that wasn't the case, I used yep. to always make fun of them that their moms didn't love them, right? Well, because they gave them like Tyson frozen that's chicken. Fair. And I'm yeah. like, your mom does not love you, bro. And they'll get so mad. Yeah, she does. I'm like, yo, your mom's giving you well, I remember, chicken nuggets for dinner. <laughs> yeah. It's dinner. It's not I remember, a quick lunch. <laughs> I know. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. I remember on. asking another, and actually a food blogger, and I obviously won't mention her name, but I was like, what's your favorite you know, recipe that you really miss on holidays? Or what do you request at your birthday to eat? And, you know, because for me, it'd be like cabbage rolls, kibbe, kusa, hushwi, all the Lebanese food. She's like, um, gosh, I guess I've never really thought about it. Um, she had to like really think about it for a long time. And then she's like, I guess 
her chili is really good and it was like chili from like the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook but and that was when I realized which by the way I'm sure is delicious chili and if that gets her happy memories that's amazing but that's when I realized that it's not necessarily you, you don't want to take for granted if you come from a rich food history because think yeah. about it my kids are fourth generation American the fact that they're going to grow up eating authentic Syrian food from Damascus, Syria yeah. is something that many Americans lose. They don't actually have a tie oh, yeah, to their heritage. Yeah. Sure. And, you know, we can tease about but like that really just made me so lucky that I know where I come from through the food, you know. So were you, totally. all, were you always a cook? I mean, I just, I mean, I like to cook. So. And your mother is the most amazing cook. She's a great cook. Yeah. So My you grew up cook. around it. Yeah. And I've always just. You know, but I, I like to make, I don't like to get super complex, but mm. really good ingredients. Like, you know, the... High quality meat. If you put, you know, good inputs, you're going to get a good output, right? <laughs> you know? You should try it sometime, Vince. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> get some good crowd product. <laughs> I mean, this is what I do. So, yeah. I mean, I like... So, the cooking. Back to yeah. the question. Yeah, okay. You quality know, cooking, time with the fam. Quality cooking. time. And I'm sure your family's enjoying the cooking, because now you also have more people yeah. to cook and for. Yeah, and Janelle, too. Janelle's, yeah. you know, quite the cook. Yeah. She makes a lot of different things... The, you know that I make yeah. you know she'll open up the cookbook she goes to your website uh -huh. she does my and, favorite's when she'll be on Pinterest and one of my recipes will pop up yeah but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's just been great to you know she's experiments with recipes and our kids are great eaters that's yeah other, like your kids that's when thing. you start them eating real food that's not really a coincidence that our kids are great eaters. They want to it's like, everything. yeah, they yeah. eat every vegetable you put in front of them. Yeah. They eat, it's like, this is delicious. What is it? They just eat it. They don't. And you guys, I, I'm interjecting for all of you out there that think your kids are picky. Try next week and try next week after yep. that. A lot of young kids are expressing independence. So they're going to say they don't like it just because they're trying to separate from you. Give it a week. Give it, they're fickle. I mean, I yeah. remember the summer Jacob didn't like blueberries. I go, oh, we'll see how long. Like, imagine if you were like never giving them blueberries again. Timmy doesn't like blueberries. Yeah, like the give kid it that. a week. Yeah, you gotta keep. I didn't wait in my house, so I'll tell you that you need that. You need that. Well, you know, <laughs> we're a lot more. We're a Pinterest. So someone else is coming for you. you know when, you're, when you're a Pinterest mom now, and you see all these amazing things, you know, the bentos, and like give them a variety. Just no, it, make, it makes offer sense. Offer it again. And offer different. it again. Like, I would watch my friends like fun, like just be picky. I'm like, dude, that would not even fly in my house. But half friends yeah. are picky because their mom and if you no, don't eat kale, saying. Sally, Timmy's not gonna eat kale either. Like you gotta yeah. lead by example. Well, also, like you know, you know, we're getting off topic. But like, I'm not gonna eat it. In, in my household, like, oh, then you're not eating anything else. Well, that's a like, valid. So pick it. Don't make like, kids no food. dessert until the green beans are gone. <laughs> Well, also, that, like, if you put up a fight about food that people worked like remember, yeah, for yeah. we worked hard for this. Is bigger than, and we made That's it for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like that defiance of like, okay, you don't want to eat green beans, right? But like, and my dad and my mom's always got to teach us life lessons. Like, well, in life, there's, you're going to have green bean moments. Yeah. So sure. you, can't, like, you can't sit out from the green beans. Correct. You can't pick your color. That's not how life works. Yeah. So, like, at least try to eat some of it. Yeah. Right? But then I see my friends, like, when I was a kid, like, oh, I'm not eating this. Oh, oh, yeah. I don't like cream cheese that touches my other bagel so I'm not right. eating it I'm like bro am I also right. like, <laughs> yeah. eating, we're gonna sit we're gonna miss school to eat that bagel yeah. you know what I'm saying like in the yeah. funny way like um, but get back to alright so so the time. third yeah. which you know I guess that you, you placed a, even more of a premium on it but just exercise yeah. and fitness mm -hmm. nothing crazy so let's talk about that what was your cause I I am super into fitness and all that so and, and also the the I've seen someone who will become healthier over the pandemic, yeah. which as a healthy living blogger, that makes me so happy. So yep. before pandemic, I'm assuming maybe lack of time, you were on the road a lot more. You, what, why I was are doing you, it then too. So why are you healthier oh. or more active now? Or why is it easier now to stay fit? Well, it's just, you know, the, and I gotta say, just having a conversation in person, I know. 3D versus I know. over Zoom, it's just not the same. It is not Zoom. the we're same. We're on video all the time and, I, yeah. and I'm, you know, I'm thankful for it because if this would have happened yeah. 10 years ago, it would have been a mess from that standpoint. But just three dimensional interaction you can't beat it. is, yeah, you can't beat it. Um, so before, yeah, I was doing, you know, I, I, I'll run three times a week. Okay. Uh, nothing crazy, like three miles. Um, and I would three do, more than I've ever run. And I'll do, you know, weight stuff at MVP. But then the weights went away. Right. You couldn't get any weights, couldn't do anything. No. Yeah. So, I still can't get any of them heavier than a six pound. <laughs> Not kidding. <laughs> so there's a group of guys, and this has been a godsend. Uh, and we, it's called the Grand Rapids Run Club. So if you guys want to check it out, it's on Instagram. It's actually a thing. 
We yeah, have an I've Instagram heard of it. page. We have there's like uh, eight of us started the group. Every Saturday we meet downtown Ada uh, at ten thirty. We'll run you know four miles, and then we come back to Zayton and we have Bloody Marys, a couple of beers. Oh my God. We'll get Zayton's some hummus. My favorite restaurant. <laughs> but after a four mile run, and oh, then yeah. having a couple of drinks together, yeah. and just the human connection, yeah. and yeah. fresh talking air, about our weekends and fresh air. And it's rain or shine. It started in February. It actually started right before the pandemic hit. Okay. Took on a whole new meeting. Isn't it funny the- how getting out of the house? We bought bikes in the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. We had never biked as a family. There's just something about getting out of the house. And almost like when you're on a bike or like you're you're running away. <laughs> you're, you're like, yeah. it's like there's something about like, I'm never going back. Like, you know, just a, there's a different feeling versus like <laughs> sitting in a, normally I'm just like in a square doing a circuit. You know, you're not yeah. leaving the house. You're in. You don't leave the. There's something about fleeing a home that you've been forced to be landlocked into, like for sure. That has such a freeing feeling. Because like I went from like having a little alone time to never having any alone time, and that was a little yeah, intense. Yeah, right. So the bike was like the first time I could be alone. Mm-hmm. That was amazing. Yeah, I feel like running would be. This has one. been tough on moms. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we oh, talk wow. about how... That's crazy. I was about to ask you about that. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's dads yeah. doing stuff that they do. There's the a difference. Kids, the kids don't even get me started um, I know. how much they're not learning right now until yeah. they're going to be back in school all the time, every day. Oh, we just, our kids just had conferences. John, just the two weeks. Thank God they're in school. They First of all, they came back. They had lost learning. Yeah. Already in two months because they quizzed them in the beginning and, it, and then two months and then... And already up 20 percentage. I mean, I just, we can't do that at home. No. And thank no. God they can make, they teachers. said they were going to make up for it once they were in school, but, and they are, but God for like, they they just all lost a ton of knowledge. And they were doing school. There's no way to do it at home. Yeah. I mean, unless you're a home, and by the way, what we did is a disrespect to homeschooling moms because homeschooling <laughs> is not what we were doing. We were like emergency trying to, do some lessons. Homeschooling is a real skill oh, that takes course. years of research. Yeah. And there's a lot of homeschooling women I know that have been doing it for years. And, and that's very different than what we were doing. Right. So I just want to get that out there. Well, too. a lot of people are working. Well, you can't that's, work and educate your children. Well, yeah, no. Totally and many different. businesses like mine got a lot busier. So that was the other interesting thing. And also, like, imagine if you're working in a hospital. Like, you couldn't... Not everyone's businesses came to a halt. Yeah. So that was, you know, and neither is a good situation, but it's, yeah, it's a... It also, wasn't... kids weren't prepped to learn on Zoom. No, overnight they were told right? not like, going back to school. They didn't say friends. goodbye to their friends. Well, it's yeah. like this, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, it's the engage- in, in engagement part. For younger kids, it's even more distraction, more they need it. They yeah, need and like, it. Yeah. It's, it was cool to see the pivot, right? And like... Like schools didn't give up. Yeah, thanks. right. Yeah. <laughs> I had a lot of friends there, teachers, and like they would, they all send me Snapchats of their, their students. Oh pass yeah, because like, like the school makes them like these kids start school at seven thirty a.m. on a Zoom call. Yeah, yeah. that's not gonna wake you up. No, you have to, you have to no. get out of Our here. walk to school is what wakes up. <laughs> yeah, like by like the time you get out of your yeah. bed and then you're at school, you like talk yeah. to ten people. You you teach not like you fall asleep your first hour, right? Like, right. Yeah. Think about just being like a high school kid who's like you know just yeah. too cool for everything. Like, you think these kids are, like, so excited to go on yeah. Zoom and, like, be on, on the computer for eight hours straight? No. Class to class to class to class. I'm like, so I, I was, you know, it's it funny to hear insight like that because I'm like, there's no way these kids are actually paying attention and learning. Like, I don't, even when I'm on a Zoom call or Skype, so I probably listen to total yeah. 10 minutes I want to ask you about something. So you mentioned this has been hard on moms, which I agree because yeah. what I actually discovered, and you can tell me if you notice this, I don't know what percentage of your, your 50 people in your office, how many 40 are forty? Yeah. How many are men versus women? I would say, yeah, the majority are. I mean, I would say probably sixty forty, or I should know this sixty forty or seventy thirty. Women, women, more and women. do many of them have kids? You are in the city. yes, a growing number. Okay, they have kids and families. Yeah. Okay, so the biggest thing that I noticed, because obviously it's a stereotype that it's harder for women, but I what I found was that. So my husband works for a Fortune 500 company, BDO, the accounting firm, and Mm -hmm. I obviously work for myself, so I've been working from home this whole time. And he obviously was working in an office, never ever worked from home. Granted, he works in technology, he handles Microsoft Teams, it's not like he couldn't handle the tech side, but again, total change of culture. There was not a lot of remote working in terms of 100%. Okay, so 
What happened was kids are now home. Yeah. We have, at this point, it was kindergarten and second grade. So as you can also imagine, Zoom with a kindergartner, Gosh. a little fidgety Can't boy. Imagine. He was shutting off the screen. The teacher yeah. was emailing, is everything okay? No, <laughs> he's like... not interested in it. So, but they were worried something was wrong at home. So <laughs> He'll play Fortnite. All sorts of like <laughs> issues. And long story short, what we found was that most of, and my husband works in technology, so it was it's a predominantly male office. Mm-hmm. And their lives weren't as disrupted because they all have wives that were tending to the kids in the homeschooling. Sure. And that was something that I noticed is that, you know, it the balance did seem to be off there and that it was almost just assumed that women had to kind of piece out of their careers for a little bit. And I know it's like a generalization, but that was something that I saw everyone that Rich talked to was not really, I'm not saying their lives were interrupted, but they weren't in charge of, whereas like Rich and I, because of my business, like we had to be 50-50. Mm-hmm. So Rich couldn't keep having this perfect environment of uninterrupted Zoom calls. You know, before the pandemic, we'd be nervous if a kid would come in the room. Yeah. Thank God, by the way, that's all done because I've been trying to pretend I didn't have kids for 11 years and that's why <laughs> I, have, I have kids. <laughs> like, hey everybody, I'm, I'm an actually mom in real life. So like, calls got interrupted and I just love though that that's my pandemic perk. We don't have to pretend. Moms don't have to pretend we have kids anymore. Working moms are allowed to have kids again, which we can't overlook that. That's a good point. Because the yeah. pressure that I used to face to make sure my call would be at a time, I lock the door. Because, you know, kids shove their hands and they send notes. Like, they find a way in. Yeah. Like, <laughs> they so find funny. a way in. And now the, the pressure of coming off unprofessional, if you have a life, sure. is gone. In fact, now people are like, oh, yeah, what's her name? <laughs> Suddenly they're like, <laughs> it's like humanity now. Well, it's crazy because you think about it. It's like we're all spread out, right? Yeah. So we're, we're, we've never been, you know, more further apart. Yet we're able to peer in each other's yes. lives in a way that we never had before. Mm-hmm. Correct. You, know, you can see inside someone's, you know, wherever their office is, in their yes. bedroom, in their living room, wherever, and you see you're their like, pets okay. and their kids. Yeah. And like that color. The uh-huh. Inside of their house. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's Office really on top, well, casual. Yeah, uh, I have a theory on this because, like, we were so so. We're the most connected we've ever been. Yeah. Before the pandemic, because of our phones. Right. But not yeah. really in real life. Correct. Like, yeah. In terms of like, yeah. oh, what's your, what's your like, house look like? Or what's I'm not your, gonna compare. Contracts, what are your kids' names? But I'm pretty sure, like, being a mom in the '70s, like, there's no phone. No. To get away from, like, yeah. you had to be around. Oh yeah. Or you had to go like hide. Or you were literally like, like leave the house. Or you're right? drinking cocktails. Or drinking yeah. cocktails or yeah. whatever you had to do. <laughs> And it's funny how the pandemic, I feel like, made humans more human. Yeah. Because now, for sure. like, for sure. Like, let's say, you know, you're a busy guy, you're busy, you guys traveling, whatever. Unless say you're not around your family. Yeah. You guys are. Oh, yeah. But now, like, you're, like, <laughs> you're really around. Well, and like, our kids yeah. used to there's, go to school. There's no, like, yeah. oh, you're like, okay, Tuesday. You oh, know, you again? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I told you yes three hours ago. It's still yes, right? Oh, like, yeah. That, that is, like, happening. So, from, like, a single guy like me, it was interesting yeah. to watch working families yeah. uh, who don't have the nannies and the yeah. helps, right? Be able to manage uh, their current life and still be able to kind of, even, some people even grow, grew their business. Correct. Oh, my yeah, right? mine was up 900% the month of the stay in place. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. It was insane. That's remarkable. It was awesome, but there is a bit of anxiety that happens when your company is growing and you can't lean in because you have to teach your kids now. Mm-hmm. And also like, still feed your dinner work out like all those other things sure. that most people it's like the first thing to come off the list mm-hmm. i refuse to do that yeah so that it was just it was amazing but the, it was amazing it's hard when you're super ambitious to not be able to lean in like a thousand percent to that. so that, that goes back you said something that just reminded me of something earlier so you said something about like okay do, do we really want to grow even more yeah are you the ambitious partner or you're more like okay we're good or you guys both are like even on that Ooh, and how do you know like we do yeah how do you yeah. want to stop or want to push the gear well you know we get to 10 in revenue and that's yeah. when you know we're on the eye we're on the radars of a lot of you know different yeah. private equity companies mm-hmm. uh communications marketing pr holding companies so just to be on the radar for folks like that but we're not looking to do anything anytime soon yeah. we want to keep I mean, getting back to your earlier question, Liz, like what are the great, what are the greatest perks? Just being in control of your own destiny. Oh. You know, being able to make decisions and to, you know, to, to do right by people and to build those relationships. Because at some point that would have to lessen if you were to continue. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And 
We're trying. We don't. We we still haven't decided like what that event will look like. Yeah. You know. You just enjoy whether it's our. You know, I think we both love the idea of having employees kind of come up and yeah take right. ownership or mm-hmm. you know. But these are these these are things that are a ways off. So Definitely. if you're not going to came in this year with your partner, you can do something in another. You know, Ruba's allowing people in. Well, we get St. together. Thomas. We. It's hard to get the families together right now just because the oh, kids yeah. are in school and different age groups. Yeah. But um, he and I still, like he was in town a couple weeks ago. We were up at my cottage. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. So he'll come up three or four times a year. We'll have like spent two or three days up at, at my place. He's a member of Medina Country Club, which for all your golfers out yeah. there, for your husbands at golf or whatever, it is one of the finest golf courses and country clubs or wives. on the planet. Yeah. Well, I'm saying dude, there, I'm there's a lot of golfers <laughs> out there. Um, so That's we cool. spend a lot of time out in suburban Chicago when I'm out there. So we, you know, in our respective hometowns, there's a lot of cool things we can do to entertain one another and mm-hmm. host. Has there been any downside to the pandemic that, you know, maybe you didn't see coming and how have you overcome it? Well, yeah, I'll tell you. Or, the, or if you're in it, like, let's know, not just be all butterflies and roses. Like what's oh, been no. some of the downsides? You know, when you think about managing and leading you know, your team and you know, you think about mental wellness issues. These are real, real issues yeah. out there right now. So it was like in the first It's an election year, which isn't helping at all. Oh gosh. I know. Oh, Liz, why do you Don't even well, I'm just that. I'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> we're not gonna get into that and by the way, by the time this airs, the probably new president. But I'm just saying that's a it's an intense It is. Because even like a lot of families are divided politically, like ours, like it's a it's an intense it's an intense time. So it, it was intense pandemic or not. And then I feel like it's just a lot. So here's what I'd say. So like the first two to three months, right? Everybody's like, you know, um, running on adrenaline. This yeah. is new. It's novel. We're all doing this We're going to get, we got this. this yeah. Right. <laughs> and then we get in, but you know, this thing's got a long And we tail. realize the length of it. You know, Remember people in the game like, this will be done by 4th of July. <laughs> yeah. Or Easter. <laughs> We're going to all be back in church for Easter sure. Sunday. Um, so this thing has a long tail. And, and almost then, we don't know the end, which and, is hard and, to... and people have different working environments, you know, at home, different things going on. And, you know, and there's just, you know, we have some people on our team that need to get in the office. They mm-hmm. need to be around the team. They got to get out of their bedroom or their you know, yeah. two-bedroom apartment. Um, yeah, the city life. So there's that. It's like trying to accommodate. And then, but, you know, for those folks, it's like, hey, you know, having empathy, trying to pump them up, trying to be. And you got folks, too, that, you know, maybe they're not married. Mm-hmm. And right. they live alone. And yeah. And now we're in month seven or it's eight. a lot of day. isolation. There's a lot of that isolation and anxiety that comes with it. So just being in tune with everybody's situation, because you're going to have you know, lapses in service here and there. You're right. going to have something that goes wrong. You're, things that can be more efficiently dealt with like this. Mm-hmm. Um, but you got to deal with it, you know, with the means that we have available, which is so, the means that we have available. And But we only have, you know, five, as we talked about earlier, we have five out of 40 people coming to the office right now. We are hopeful that we will get people back to the office at some point. Once we get a vaccine, once people are comfortable, maybe it's six or eight or 12 months away. I don't know. Yeah. But we do want to get people back in, you know, together again. And I think everyone wants to do that. It's yeah. just, so it do is, you, do yeah. you think that's going to happen? Like, like go back to normal after things get figured out? Or do you think there always will be an aspect of, I mean, you guys already did remote stuff, obviously. Oh but, yeah. It, we won't go back to, I don't think we'll ever go back to the way it was. Yeah. Any of us. Do you still see it worth the real estate investment? Or do you kind of like, well, maybe we should like, are you guys leaning toward co-working spaces, or do you need your own space? Is, like, this, is an office like, downtown Chicago as appealing as it once was for, um, for your goal of recruiting? Well, talent? I would say it's probably the the product that was that we agreed, you know, previously agreed to pay for. The yeah. value of the product, I think, has changed <laughs> a lot. You know, Talk about I would it. think that's clear, but um, <laughs> it's going to take a little time for that to work itself out. Yeah. In terms of, you know, the pricing and what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Did those um, people, like, the owners of the building, did, did they lose tenants in your, in your whole building? Well, floor. they have leases. I mean, they hold the yeah. cards. But, yeah, unless, you know, a company, like, 
files for chapter 11. Yeah. You know, it's like, there's, there's really not a whole lot you can do yeah. to get out of your lease obligations. Yeah, Rich's company signed a 20-year lease right before. Yeah. <laughs> We're happy. We have no problem. We want to, we like the space. Yeah. We like the building. We, we believe in it. And so, if I'm in town, I need a little space to work in. Oh some my empty gosh. offices. I have. We have like close to ten thousand feet. Uh, okay. where you can, <laughs> yeah. Not even kidding. Fortunately, the uh, the fridge and the coffee maker, all oh, that stuff. Yeah, yeah. we've already we've had it all <laughs> retrofitted with the plexiglass and. Oh, you have done all, all that stuff. Oh yeah, and yeah. that's a big investment. Oh yeah. Well, you have to, right? You got to make people feel yeah. safe when I come back. Yeah. I'm so interested in like corporate life and businesses like that. The like, future of it. Like, how does it operate? What do you value now more? Right? Because I think there, there was, like, a kind of cool thing to bring someone into your office. Like, this is our space. Very oh, cool. God, yeah. yeah. I miss see, it. People can see the people working. I miss in. that. I miss yeah. going to New York and seeing my clients in New York. I miss going to Chicago mm-hmm. and seeing my clients in Chicago and having drinks and meeting in their space, meeting in our space, whiteboarding stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, that, The problem with Zoom is now... You know that that water cooler conversation has been taken away. So now you have organized, structured meetings. So it, it loses some of like the the relationship building that would just happen authentically. When you, then you get the fatigue, right? Well, I'll have days where I have like seven Zoom meetings. That's too much. You know, and it's you're exhausted yeah. at the end of that. It's awful. It's exhausting. It really is. And also, so we're trying to phone calls are that. still allowed. Just a reminder that we don't have to do video calls all the time. A phone call is fine. The simplicity and intimacy of a old fashioned phone call is fantastic. It, it is. And as a female, it's not every. Awesome. <laughs> Rich's company was like, you guys need to turn your videos on more. Make it Not every woman is camera ready, folks. So just a reminder out there that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's we're funny starting to pull back on that. We're starting well, to pull back. It's like, what? You know, I forget. There was an article that uh, one of our uh, team members was talking about on a staff call today, which is why I couldn't do it at noon today. Uh, like new guidance on yes. when to do Zoom. Yes. And when to just go back to Thank regular you. conference calls because yeah well, yeah why why can't or, we go back to that? well that's because I'm thing. meeting clients well, well, yeah it was well, like well, thing, though, like people like I mean I feel like it's American culture right anything that hits us yeah yeah or we get an iPhone everyone has iPhone 12 and everyone's trying to Snapchat yeah, yeah. like we do we do everything at 100 percent whatever <laughs> the group has decided. Like you totally. see, you see what we decided to do. So now Zoom, Zoom has been around forever. Yeah. Right. And I'm so mad about this side. I missed out on the like the stock buying. I just completely missed oh, it. Oh, I know. I wouldn't make that much money. But like, how about the heat lamps? <laughs> yeah. The heat lamp companies. <laughs> oh my god. Like. Yeah. So it's it's so funny. But also, what I'm trying to get down to people is like, okay, how many meetings are worth it or are not worth it? Mm. Right. I think what we're not being exposed to on like on a Zoom call or a conference call is like, wait. Am I needed in this meeting for a whole? Does this need to be an hour? Well, it was early right? stuff. Early stuff in the pandemic. It's like we increased all the meeting cadences. Yeah. yeah. You know, with account teams and different committees. Because you want to stay connected. You want to stay connected. Of course. You want to look after people. You want to, hey, are you doing okay? Yeah. You know, and yeah. we've also, which I think has been really good. We've been no, there's, that's smart. Over communicating on just financial performance, cash flow, yeah. state yeah. of the firm. Just so people know. Hey, oh, yeah. We're good. doing well. Things are good. You know? Yeah, because you don't want the added anxiety of like job no. loss or all that insecurity is not good no. for any company. No. So yeah, I think that that's super important. Yeah. All right, so let's start to slowly wrap this up. Okay. Can I just say one thing too? It's yeah. Like, yeah. In this world that we live in right now, um, I've been through a few downturns, right? Yeah. You know, we had the financial crisis, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Yeah. Had um, 9/11. you know 9/11 before that, dot com before that. This is such a unique moment for business because we have a global health crisis, right? Mm-hmm. We have a uh, an economic crisis, and we have a race in, in, in a quality Probably crisis, right? We have the all time. these different things happening at the same time, and companies and organizations, big and small, are trying to figure out how do we take a stand, how do we do the right thing. Yeah. And, you know, and on that latter point, you know, you're seeing, I, I think we're at a point where there's going to be serious change and movement in terms of, you know, you don't just say, here's what we stand for, but it's like, here's yeah. what we stand for. And here's our pledge. Exactly. Here's our commitment. Here's what we're going to do. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations got that wrong. I think early yeah. in this process, they're getting called out for it. Right. It's like, of course. Yeah. You don't, 
you know, you're not going to tolerate that or put up with that, right. blah, blah, blah. But what are you going to do? Right. What do you guys do at Green Target? <laughs> well, we're... So Putting we're, on the spot now. No, 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 no. We're actually, we're updating a lot of our different plans, but it comes down just in, ter in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion. There's the talent piece of it. There's the financial commitment. There's yeah. community investment. Uh, a big part of it, too, is with a client collaboration being, you know, if we're talking about, you know, just in terms of the diversity standpoint, we're going to bring more diverse voices right, into exactly. client programs, which our clients aren't extremely diverse, right. I would say, in the grand yeah. scale, but yeah. they have <laughs> smart people, yeah. really smart people, um, experts, subject matter authorities they can bring into programs. So we're making a difference there and, and just trying to get everybody involved. Yeah, you know. I mean that's that's such a huge thing, and I hope companies uh, realize that they have to take it seriously. Yeah, and the gimmicks won't work anymore. No, right? They won't. Like, it won't work they anymore. People are and savvy so. enough to know if a company is just like. And so, yeah, like, dialing. either way, yeah. you, whatever. I don't. Really, I'm saying whatever you decide to do, right? And just do it fully. And I think you, I think you guys are, you guys got that. And like figuring out how to communicate that, especially with your clients. Yeah. Like, well, if you do it, a tweet. Or a statement on New York Times not gonna. No. That doesn't work anymore. B, don't just seem. B, yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. People are gonna go in your glass door. They're gonna. Yeah. Add you on LinkedIn. They're gonna see. Your, they're gonna. They're gonna dive deep. Yeah. And so, like, make sure if you do take that that route, <laughs> you do it right. Yeah. I agree. Amen. Are right, you have any closing thoughts for us? No, just uh, I love this. It's just fun to sit down and have a conversation. A Next time we'll cook and have colleagues. cocktails while we do it. Yeah, I think it's really cool what you guys are doing. And I know, I would love to have a cocktail and to do the cook thing with you guys. We'll do like that. Do yeah. Where can people learn more about Green Target? Um, Greentarget.com. Okay, perfect. So and can yeah, people our, connect with you on Twitter or email? Yeah, or? I'm on Twitter, at J.E. Corey. Um, LinkedIn is probably where Perfect. I post and do the most, just because the post and do the most. Oh, well, I mean, if I'm out on social sharing or commenting or engaging, I'm a huge LinkedIn fan. Yeah, I mean, it's the greatest. They just rolled out of stories, business executives, and it's getting better. Yeah, it's yeah, getting better and better. I'm um, a fan. But yeah, no, GreenTarget.com. I think it more than ever it tells our story. And check out our manifesto. On oh yeah. Well, positioning because whatever you do, I think there'll be aspects of it that resonate. I think you're right. Well, John, I learned so, so much. So, yeah, this has been great. Nice Thanks for great. coming on. Of course. All right. Yeah. Peace. Bye. Hey, you gonna learn? You gonna learn this jazz too? Hey, yes, you going to learn this jazz, 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 jazz? Ooh, I even got your girl some jazz yesterday. True, true, true. Let's make sure you subscribe, 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 and subscribe, baby.